Central to any story is perspective, and the most common perspective we see is that of a protagonist, a hero who overcomes challenges and hardships, and almost as common as a protagonist is an antagonist. Sometimes a hero has to fight nature or society, maybe overcome themselves or another person, but today we're going to be talking about a hero's antithesis, a villain. Some of my favorite stories approach antagonists in a different way, focusing on the conflict between two people who think they're doing the right thing. But historically, villains have been the most common form of an antagonist. The easiest way to get us to side with the perspective of the protagonist is to have a bad guy, someone that's evil, doing things that are clearly reproachable, to where we can't help but side with the main character and their need to beat the villain. But inherent to its nature, tropes have been overdone, and I've become very tired of villains that are evil for the sake of being evil. However, with any trope, there's always an opportunity to innovate, to do something different. A lot of stories have moved away from villains, making sympathetic antagonists that you just don't happen to agree with. But then if you turn it on its head, embrace that trope, embrace the trend, and then slowly reveal a villain using clever writing and performances to convince us they're not, suddenly it's a twist. What a clever approach, where you're using viewers' expectations to create a more compelling character. Because when writers create a villain effectively, there's something deeply terrifying about having to watch our protagonist face that monster an unsettling discomfort, having to sit with something that's so broken it's actually evil. Because there's always room for another masterfully crafted villain. Let's take a second and look at The Last of Us. Our protagonists, Joel and Ellie, aren't what I would define as heroes. They're deeply flawed, violent characters. Because honestly, heroes wouldn't be able to survive the world The Last of Us is set in. No one's squeaky clean. Like I said in my previous videos, empathy has been weaponized, because in this world, if you're too trusting, inevitably you'll be betrayed. This is a central part of The Last of Us, this reduction kindness. We've all heard that cliche that the zombies aren't the real monsters, the humans are, but it's true. Humans are incredibly capable of terrifying violence, and while the infected are horrifying, they're very straightforward. But in The Last of Us, every time you interact with a human, you don't know what you're getting. Part of the reason this creates such a compelling setting is because humans are inherently social creatures. In episode 8, we see a character point out that no one can survive out here on their own. And I think that has less to do with physical survival, and much more to do with humans' intense trauma response to isolation. And that leads us into today's villain, the Preacher David. Episode 8 of The Last of Us opens with David reading scripture, Revelation 21. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes before, symbolically, his sermon is interrupted by the tears of a young girl. She's likely about Ellie's age, and fittingly, just lost her father. And David walks over to her, standing in front of a sign that says, When we are in need, he shall provide. This is the first of a consistent thing we'll see throughout this episode, where singular actions, when interpreted with good faith, seem empathetic and kind. Do you remember what comes next? But when you understand David's true intentions, offer a completely different meaning. And God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. But first we see a very convincing empathy. Neither sorrow nor crying, neither will there be any more pain. That if you're watching without context, the former things are passed away. seems like a kindness. Do you know what that means? Offering his followers who live in a violent, terrible world a light before she asks when her father can be buried. When can we bury him? And there's the first hint of undertones. Something else is going on. We cut to James, and there's a silent understanding between him and David. The ground is too cold to dig. We'll bury your father in the spring. Immediately following that scene, we see James and David talking about Josiah and Martin. Notice that these are all biblical names. In the Bible, David was defined as God's chosen shepherd, to be king. He replaced Saul, who was inept and incapable. This runs parallel with something we slowly discover about David in the future, his ego. But before we get there, we need to talk about this scene with Ellie. Throughout this scene, David seems very grounded, charismatic, and compelling. It's hard to trust strangers, I know, but I honestly mean you no harm. And for what it's worth, there's room for you in our group, if you want. Like someone who's being pretty reasonable and even averse to conflict. I'm a decent man. Just trying to take care of the people who rely on me. You're their leader? It wasn't my choice. It was theirs, but... Yes. 
something we've learned throughout The Last of Us is when people offer kindness with no hesitation, it's easy to assume that there's some sort of ulterior motive. If we look back at characters who have been kind to Joel and Ellie, it always comes after a very reasonable hesitancy. And by the end of the conversation, maybe when most viewers let their guard down, we suddenly see a change in tone. He speaks in absolutes. No such thing as luck. I believe everything happens for a reason. David starts to share the story of how the winter's been harder than they expected. and He had sent four men out to scavenge in a local city. One of them didn't come back. He was a father with a daughter about Ellie's age. And we see David share pertinent information. Turns out he was murdered by this crazy man. And get this, that crazy man was traveling with a little girl. The music shifts. And then we have this close-up shot, matched with the music. Everything happens for a reason. There's something deeply unsettling about it. This indicates the start of the unraveling of David's character. The next scene we see with David is in the mess hall. Up until this point, there's kind of this assumption being made that the solemn attitude of everyone following David has more to do with the hard times than his leadership. But when David and James return with a deer, no one celebrates, and we suddenly get a better picture. We start to see that David's a pretty violent dude. And the use of threats and intimidation comes back pretty immediately. Ellie's stuck as a prisoner, and David tries to convince her that they're the same. But if you can't find a way to trust me, then yes, you are alone. He quickly moves to threats when Ellie doesn't respond to his demands in the way he wants. As Ellie's trying to figure out a way to escape, she notices something. A severed human ear. David tries to justify his decision. You're gonna chop me up into little pieces. I'd rather not. And convince Ellie that she should join him. We start to see his true opinions. You have a violent heart, and I should know. I've always had a violent heart, and I struggled with it for a long time, but then the world ended and I was shown the truth. By cordyceps. What does cordyceps do? Is it evil? No. It's fruitful, it multiplies, it feeds and protects its children, it loves. Why are you telling me all of this? Because you can handle it. An ego that's grown so large it's developed into a god complex. He uses Christianity despite not believing it, because he thinks he's a shepherd, and he believes those who follow him are sheep, and that he deserves to control them. But once again Ellie refuses, this time a little bit more physically. And we get this magnificent line. Ellie. What? Tell them that Ellie is a little girl who broke her fucking finger! How did you put it, hmm? Tiny little pieces? And we see a complete tone change. His polished presentation slips away, and his self-proclaimed violent heart comes out. As we watch this episode, a character that seemed so reasonable 30 minutes ago now is so vile. Quickly, things start to fall apart. James and David plan on killing Ellie. However, she uses the bite on her arm to distract them and kill James before escaping upstairs. And what was originally a subtle descent into madness becomes exponential. Everything starts to slip and a fire starts. And then suddenly the bad guy stops being a villain and starts being a monster. I've decided you do need a father. So I'm going to keep you, and I'm going to teach you. And then Ellie has to face this monster, and she screams. It feels like she's screaming for herself and the audience. And like the top comment on my last video stated so eloquently, it absolutely crushes me. And I want nothing more than for it to stop. So when it finally does, you can't help but be blown away by how effectively they made you hate David.